Merry Christmas, y'all. Merry Christmas. It's a southern Christmas, isn't it? Boy, if you're from up north, welcome. This is what it's supposed to feel like. This is probably more original. The original Christmas was not wintry from what we know, okay? May not have even been this time of the year, okay? But uh, I like a Christmas with palm trees. I think Bethlehem had a few palm trees. I kind of like that. Maybe Christmas on the beach, right? Does that sound good, Logan? Swimming pool Christmas. That's the kind. And Logan, you did an awesome job in that videos, in those videos. Pardon? I messed up a couple times. Oh, you did not. If that's all I did, phew, yeah, we like those mess ups, whatever they are. That adds to it. Hey, we're going to be playing a game right now, okay? Logan's playing, right? You're not going to play. Okay, Reese. She is, t- she is the older of the sisters, can you tell? Yeah, and so I don't know if there's any other kids that want to come up. We're going to play a game just for a little bit. I don't know if any of you watch Sesame Street anymore, or is it too lame? Is Sesame Street too lame, kids? Probably. Now, I know your parents have at least watched it, because they're lame. (laughs) Come on up. We're going to see some things, and I need some help. This is is the song. um, You can play this next clip. This is a song we grew up on. Do you remember this? It's not like the other. It's one of these things. Which one is it? You know, Phil had a hard time figuring it out at first. Yeah, Phil was going like, wait a minute, they're different shapes. Which one's different? Which one's... Yeah, that was easy, wasn't it? Yeah, well, we're going to do that with Christmas things, okay? Things that we associate with Christmas. So I'm going to show you some pictures, and you have to tell me which one doesn't fit with the others. There'll be four different shots. So we'll start out with the first one is a crib, okay? A baby crib. What's the next one? A mobile, a baby mobile. Hmm, do they fit together? Let's see, the third one is blankets, nice colors. And the fourth one is? A feeding trough. (laughs) Which one doesn't fit? The feeding trough. Yeah, you're right. Okay, let's try it again now, okay? Here's something else, okay? Santa. Okay, let's see who's next. Rudolph. What's that elf's name? I don't remember. Isn't he? What? What? Herbie. Is he the dentist guy? Yeah, okay. The third one. A stinky shepherd out in the middle of nowhere. And then the fourth one is Frosty. The shepherd doesn't fit in. Isn't that interesting? Okay, let's try another one, okay? Christmas lights and a Christmas tree and a um, tinsel or garland. And then finally, (laughs) what is that? Do you know what that is? It's a cow pie, not the kind of pie you eat, okay? Which one doesn't fit in? The cow pie, of course. Okay, and finally, okay, finally, diapers and a changing table and straw and a baby bassinet or bathtub. The straw doesn't fit in. But you know what? This is the amazing thing, kids, and this is what we find out that's kind of shocking. The first Christmas, there wasn't tinsel and garland and trees and Santa and all that stuff. Not the first one. The first one, the four things that we had at that Christmas, I know there was a feeding trough and there was definitely um, the stinky shepherds. And probably a cow pie or two, and probably some straw. And yet that's the best Christmas of all. That's the one that started every other Christmas that we're talking about tonight, okay? And Logan, you and the rest of the kids did a marvelous job of talking about what I'm calling, we're going to celebrate the gift of Christmas present. Last week, we actually, in service, talked about the gift of Christmas 
future, the future that we get through Christmas, through the prophecies of Isaiah, and that wonderful future that we have before us. So we're kind of doing a kind of a Ebenezer Scrooge Dickens thing here. So we went from the future now to the present, and next week on January 1st, our next worship service, we're going to talk about the gift of Christmas, the past, okay? I know, that's kind of weird, but we all need that our past, you know, a lot of people's pasts haunt them. And we need a gift for that. And we're going to talk about that next week. But today we're talking about Christmas present. And the fact that that's kind of a double entendre, two words in one, two meanings in one. The gift of Christmas right here, present, and the gift of Christmas now, present. And the gift is God's own presence in front of us. He presents himself to us tonight in the most odd way. The presence that he gives us, he gifts us, is the one that we need above all the other ones that are under our trees or anywhere else in our lives, okay? So we're going to be talking about three things tonight. How this gift makes a difference, how the gift is given, and how the gift is received. But we're going to talk about how the gift makes a difference, first of all. I don't know if you've come to this conclusion yourself. Um, I think most people do. This world is a very dark place, Okay, there's not a lot of light in it, and um, it's a dark place, and it doesn't seem like we're getting ahead. Have you noticed that? We're in the 21st century, but sometimes it feels like we might as well be in the dark ages with the inhumanity and the cruelty that you see in the news, around the world, everywhere else. And though we've advanced with technology, now we can just tweet at each other, or we can just Facebook post all sorts of stuff, and it's still going on no matter what. It seems like we should have been able to overcome it. So we, in civilized societies, we pass a law. And it's amazing how you can circumvent that law and get around it, and the darkness still keeps going. It just doesn't stop. It, we can educate. We can throw money at it. We can do all sorts of things, but the darkness still remains. And the question is, why is that? Why is that? What's going on with that? J.R.R. Tolkien, I don't know if you've heard of him. He wrote the Lord of the Rings trilogy and a couple other books. He has one of his characters that kind of gives a profound understanding of why that happens or what's going on with this. Gandalf the White, or the Gray, or I don't know what he is at the time, a wizard, he says this, always after a defeat and a respite, the shadow takes another shape and grows again. In other words, he's saying, you can stop something for a time, but it seems to get around it. You can put an obstacle in front. You can thwart it. You can curb it in. You can stomp it down. You can win a victory over it, but you can't ultimately defeat the darkness that this world is facing and this world still has. Now, the Bible understands this as well, okay? Now, you might say, wait a minute. Do you want to live back in the Middle Ages or something, John? Is that what you're getting at? No, not at all. I think the technology and the science that we have today, I wouldn't even want to go back 10 years for all the medical advances that we've had, for the technological advances that we have. I am glad that we've got these things. And yet, just ask this question of yourself right now, okay? Why is it that we're still afraid in fact, we are even more afraid today, maybe, that someone, some hacker somewhere is going to take down a huge portion of the grid and cause all sorts of catastrophes. Why is it that we now are a little more wary and cautious and afraid to even go to a public place like, oh, a sporting event or a shopping mall or even a church because we're just not sure what's going to happen? Why is it that we are anxious that this world is turning ominous at times and things aren't going quite right? We know that there's darkness in this world and we just haven't quite overcome it yet. We haven't gotten that far. Now, the Bible has always understood this kind of primal issue that there is darkness in this world and that it's not an easy solution to figure it out. 
that education won't just remove it by just getting everybody, because it's not just ignorance that's the problem, and it's not the fact that religion is even going to solve it. The Bible doesn't say that that's what's going to solve the problem. The darkness is here, you see, and it's not just out there. We can't point the finger that it's over here or over there or in this or in that, but it's right in here as well. The Bible has a profound understanding of the human condition that we are enmeshed in it as well. And our lives are kind of caught up into it as well. Martin Luther, about 500 years ago, said something that I think is still very true today. He said that the human heart, the human condition is in curvatus se. That was Latin for that we are curved in on ourselves. Everything seems to orbit around us. Okay? We can make fun of that in different cartoons and self-worship. There I am. It's my universe. And it's all the stuff that's about me, and it's my stuff, and the stuff I don't like, and the things that don't matter, and everything else. That's the way we live, and it's so wrapped up in ourselves that we can't get outside of ourselves, that we can't solve it. And so we don't need just a story to tell us how to try harder in this world, because I'm still wrapped up in me. And we don't need just a story about how a legend about how God's glory has come at some point in some way in the world. We need God's glory. We don't need to just get a pep talk. We need good news. We need someone, something, somewhere, somehow to break in and change everything. And that is what the gift that we are celebrating tonight on Christmas Eve is all about. It's the gift of God's own presence among us. I love um, how those kids kind of shared this gospel story of Luke chapter 2. I also love um, the Charlie Brown Christmas special that has Linus with his, you know, his little blanket sitting up on stage talking about how those an- uh, the angel came and the shepherds were, and I think he used the King James Version, sore afraid. Don't you love that? Well, it's fascinating because when the angel shows up, the Greek for it is rather amazing. The Greek says it is uh, phobothason, phoban, megon. That is, it is, they feared with a great fear. I mean, phobo, phobia, right? You could see that it comes up twice. They were freaked out, afraid, okay? Not just sore afraid as if, ow, that just hurt a little, but they were freaked out. Okay, and what's amazing about it is the angel then says, do not be afraid, for I, behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people, for today in the city of David there is a Savior who has been born for you, he is Christ the Lord. The angel says, look, I understand you are afraid, I understand that you are terrified, that you live in a world of fear, a world that has been filled with darkness and you can't quite figure it out, but I've got good news for you, for all people. There is a Savior who is born to you that will make all the difference. This one Christmas present given to you, this child. Now, you might be surprised. This is the biblical pattern that is kind of, at first glance, you go like, what? doesn't quite make sense. And that is, whenever God's glory, in, whether the angels show up or somebody else shows up, people don't go like, oh. That's really cool. As if they are seeing a laser light show at a huge rock concert. Oh, wow. No, they freak out. They are scared witless. They don't go, wow. They go, whoa. They fall on their faces. They shrivel up and want to die when God's glory shows up. Now, why is that? Why is that? I think this story is telling us what's really kind of primal in our lives now because of this darkness, and that is this fear that we live with, okay? We live with this fear. It wasn't always quite that way. It wasn't God's intent. If you read through the entire Bible, when you start out at the beginning, you see that God created humanity, Adam and Eve. He placed them in a garden, and they were in such a wonderful, harmonious relationship with each other and with God that they even walked with God in the cool of the garden, and he and they were just totally cool with that. They were just one with that. There was no fear. There was no anxiety. There was no stress in that relationship. They were at peace with each other. They were harmonious with each other. But 
Adam and Eve listened to the advice of the serpent and said, hmm, I'd kind of like to be the center of my universe, have everything wrapped up in me, call the shots. I could be like God, make my decisions my way. And then all of a sudden, once they ate of that fruit, that basically it wasn't really about the fruit, it was about the fact that they wanted to make the choices themselves and play God. They looked at each other and they immediately felt defenseless, put on the fig leaves. They don't work so well, but they did. And there was an alienation between the two of them. Then God shows up to walk in the garden with them and they are even freaked out more. Not less, more. Imagine this. You decide to impersonate a police officer. Okay? You get the uniform, you get the badge, you get the car, you're going out, and you are, you know, you're downtown Fort Myers, and you are starting to write up traffic tickets for everyone who's jaywalking. If I were trying to do that and play that, and it's not like a candid camera thing or, you know, walking the prank or something like that, I would be nervous. I'd be anxious. I'd be a little uptight because I know I'm not, I don't know. That's not me. This is not who I, I can't do that. Now, can you imagine? You're playing the part, you're impersonating a police officer, and a police officer with 20 years experience, a keen eye, understanding the law, knows exactly all of the ways to do things, walks up to you. You're going to be more freaked out, right? We've been trying to impersonate God, playing God in our lives and we are lousy at it. So when God shows up and we see his perfection, we see all our flaws. When he, we see his glory, we see our depravity. When we see his goodness, we see all the stuff in us that is twisted and torn and broken. And of course we're freaked out because we know there's something wrong. And now, these days, trying to prove to others, overacting our parts, trying to be in control, to earn respect, to feel like we're approved, to we waste so much time and so much energy, and we are so afraid and anxious and struggling and stressed. So the angel speaks and says, fear not. You don't have to live that life of fear anymore. Behold, I'm giving you good news, great joy for all people. For to you, in the city of David, is born a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Now, when we read those passages today like Linus, we think, oh, that sounds great. It was mind-blowing to hear that word in the Gospel of Luke from the angel, that this is a Savior who is Christ the Lord. About 200 years before Jesus was born, um, there were so many Jewish people around the Roman world that didn't know Hebrew anymore. They couldn't read the Hebrew scriptures. And so about 70, as legend has it, 70 rabbinical um, Hebrew scholars got together and translated the Hebrew scriptures, which we call the Old Testament, into Greek. And when you translate, you know, from one language to another, you have to find words that match, right? Or what, what word are we going to use for this word here? That's what's so amazing about what the angel says here. Because the angel is using words that are just like, wah, wah, throwing up huge red flags or lights or a whole you know, fireworks display because they were the key words of what the people of God were looking for for a long time and words that shocked them as well. And these shepherds would have even known them. So that word Christ is not Jesus' last name, by the way. Did you know that? It wasn't Joseph and Mary Christ had Jesus Christ. No, Christ, Christos, was the translation for the Hebrew word Messiah. 
And Messiah is the anointed one of God of the line of David. He was born here in the city of David, Bethlehem, and he would be another king, but one bigger and greater and different than David, who would do so much more than what you would ever expect. And the angels were saying, here's your Messiah. But even more than that, it's the next word that was used. Lord. Lord. So the biggest problem that the Hebrews or the rabbinical scholars had in trying to figure out what uh, when translating the Hebrew scriptures, was what word to use? What word to use for the name of God that God gave to Moses at the burning bush? It's the name Yahweh, which means I am who I am, or I will be whom I will be. Yahweh, the Lord God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. What word are they going to use? And they chose, in the end, the word Kyrios, Lord. That is the word the angel uses right here in this text. Do you realize what the angel is telling the shepherds in the fields? That not only is this child, this baby, this vulnerable little infant placed in the manger... In this feeding trough, a savior, someone who will rescue you, but he is also the Messiah, the one who was anointed to take David's place, and he is the Lord. Yahweh would never allow his name to be given to another or his glory to anyone else, and the angel is saying, here is God in the flesh for you. God doesn't come to give you a little hallmark card. He doesn't come to give you a little presence. He doesn't come to give you a substance. The greatest gift of Christmas, the gift that he gives to you, that he chose to give, is the gift of himself, fully present for you in your place, in your stead, right here in this feeding trough. When you grasp that good news that God is with you, that God is for you, that God is right here with you, the fear starts to melt away because you know God is for you. When you start to live in that grace of God's favor, and that's what the angel said, that they couldn't help but break out and say, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among whom his favor rests. In other words, God has his favor, his grace upon you. He favors you. He chooses to be among us, to be the lowliest among us, to serve us, and to give us everything in this little child in a miraculous way that just kind of blows out all categories that you could ever have. And when you know that grace, you're going to have that peace. So that is the gift that makes the difference today. You can live with peace knowing you have a God who is for you, a God who understands you, a God who wants to be with you so much he becomes human for you. So that's how this gift makes a difference. Now, how is the gift given? Now, some people might say, well, You know, John, if God is so concerned about this darkness in this world and all this bad stuff in this world, why doesn't he just come down here and kick some butt, you know? Why doesn't he just come down here and pound it out? Why doesn't he just snap his fingers and get rid of all evil in this world? Boom, just like that. That'd be nice and easy, wouldn't it? Yes, guess what happens, hmm? Guess what happens? If God does that, if God just chose to get rid of the evil in this world right now, none of us would be left. And if you don't believe that, if you think that's an exaggeration, then I don't know if you know your human heart that well. Because of how wrapped up we are in ourselves and enmeshed in so so many things and have done things, thought things, wanted to do things, but just couldn't get around to it, whatever it is. It's amazing. And so God doesn't give a gift that way. Hey, I've got a couple presents up here, and I wanted... um, ah, 
So we've got a couple kids here, Soleil. If you had to choose one of these two presents, which one would you take? This one? <laughs> Pretty obviously? So yeah, this one's seen a better day. It's kind of, it looks like it got run over by a, maybe a reindeer, who knows? <laughs> At least I don't see any reindeer turds on it, okay. But it could be, and it's um, not the prettiest package, right? This one looks really nice. Now, can you tell from the outside what's on the inside? Not really, right? So what if I say that when God gives a gift sometimes, they look like this present, but it's the better gift? As we talked about at the beginning of the sermon, the first Christmas probably, we know, had a feeding trough and had stinky shepherds, possibly a lot of hay. Have you ever slept on hay? Don't do it. And cow pies. Do you know what cow pies are? It's a nice way of saying manure. Do you know what manure is? Well, your mama will explain to you what that is. Because I'm not going to get any, any more descriptive language. <laughs> but when God gives our, the greatest gift of all, he places it into the most common, ordinary. It's not flashy or anything else. He gives Jesus in a little manger. Because the Bible is basically saying, and God understands that if what his goal was is not to come into this world and just immediately make it nice for him by ridding it of all evil. He came to be the Savior. And to be the Savior meant he was going to save us from our sins. And somehow through his life, through the way that he came into this world as a vulnerable little baby, rejectable, even killable, was going to be the way to do it. Isn't that amazing? Jesus doesn't come with Kevlar jacket on and a Bradley tank around him and a thousand angels to protect him along his way. He doesn't have a secret service or a bodyguard. He doesn't have immunizations and injections. And, you know, he comes just like one of us, was born just like we are into this world so that he could save us himself. <clears throat> the darkness is so great and so enmeshed in your life that the only way that Jesus could save us, that God chose to save us, was to suffer in our place and take our fate and understand our condition and rescue us from the inside out. And that's kind of the pattern we see throughout starting right here at Christmas, and it goes all the way through the New Testament. Jesus is first laid out in a rough wooden manger, and later on he will be spread across a rough-hewn cross. Here in the city of David, this little Bethlehem, he was rejected by even his relatives, of the relatives of Joseph and Mary, and rejected so that there was no room for him at the beginning, and later on, all, the whole world will reject him and cry out, crucify him. Because that is the way he chose to come to this world to save us. So he comes in a strange weakness and a mysterious meekness so that he is totally approachable and totally vulnerable and totally taking our place and taking all the evil with him on that cross in his death. And that is why he comes this way. We wouldn't want it any other way, would we? So that's how the gift makes a difference and how the gift is given. And now the question is always how the gift is received. Now, most people are terrible at receiving gifts, by the way. Have you ever noticed that? It was just so funny, this last week I saw The Middle. I don't know if anybody ever likes The Middle, but Mike, the heck, the father, gets a pair of sunglasses from his friend Brad, and he's like, what's this? What am I supposed to do? How much was that? 
How am I supposed to get him a gift this day? You know, and he goes through, he finally goes over to Brad's house and says, how much? And he gives him $44 and some change just to pay it off. And all Brad was looking for is, wow, thank you. But, you know, we have a hard time actually giving and receiving gifts. We have a hard time receiving gifts. We always think we need to earn it. So I'll get that Christmas bonus because I know I worked hard this year, right? But we don't, when you get a gift that is, well, unexpected, you could never pay back, that you don't deserve, and you know it, what do you do with it? How do you handle it? That's why I love kids, because kids don't seem to have a problem getting gifts, do they? (laughs) And I think that's why Jesus said this. He said this in Matthew, "Um, truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you'll never enter the kingdom of God. For whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of God. So in other words, guess what, adults? We need to be more like kids. Kids don't need to turn into adults to enter the kingdom. We need to become like kids, helpless, needy, vulnerable, open, and willing to receive and just say thank you. That's it. That's it. So we see this in this story, the shepherds. I don't know if you realize this, the shepherds were considered, you know, outcasts. Well, we could consider them, you know, ruffians, hooligans, criminals, stinky, smelly. They were always unclean. They were around sheep all the time. Nobody liked them. They were the lowest of the low of society, and yet that is exactly where the good news was given first, and they were the ones to receive it, and they were welcoming of it. And Mary herself in this text says she pondered these things and treasured them in her heart. She thought about it and made the connections of what this all meant and treasured it in her heart. And so we see how the gift is received is as a little child, just with open hands, saying, wow, thank you, God. I'd never imagined that. So Luke doesn't start this story out, by the way, by saying... Uh, once upon a time. You know, it's not like a legend or a fantasy story at all, no. And he doesn't start out a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. He starts it out in the real world. He says, hey, do you remember the first time that Caesar Augustus held a census of everyone? Quirinius was the governor of Syria at the time, and that's when Joseph and Mary went to Bethlehem. Because he realizes this isn't a gift that is just a myth or a wish or a hope or an ideal to be lived. It is real. It is graphic. It is tangible. He is right here. It is the gift of God himself present in our lives. And that gift makes all the difference. Are you, at this time, ready to receive that gift? And with that gift, peace? With that gift, joy? With that gift, wholeness? Or are you going to go, wait a minute, what's What's the the catch? catch? What's What's this? What's that? You know, like like an adult. adult. It's time to be a little kid and and to just say thank you and and to celebrate celebrate tonight tonight with your family family and all of us together this gift of Jesus himself. Let's pray.